over here. Wanted to do a little update on how the Icelandic chickens have worked out for us over the years. It's getting, it's still winter here, but it's getting towards spring, at which point we'll have had this flock of birds for three years. Foggy over here. I know, sweetheart. I know. I, I know. You're a little indignant. She did not want to pick her up that mess. I, I know. You're going to want to get back to it. Mostly, our birds don't just pick a, them up like that. She really wants to start our fourth generation of chickens here. I don't know. Are you going to go out? She's wanting to set a new clutch of eggs. It is. I don't know when you may be a person watching this. This is the one egg that was actually in there that she's trying to sit on right now. I might have to let her sit. She is one of our best <laughs> broody moms. She hatched a batch. I was looking at our my uh, property calendar I keep from uh, a little over a year now uh, for just stuff around the place. And it was this day last year is when she wanted to go broody and she successfully hatched six chicks, uh, well seven and the one didn't make it, but six that survived when it was below zero the whole time. Now it's much warmer this winter. We're having an unusually warm winter. Um, but yesterday she started sitting. I pulled her off the nest a couple times this morning. She was back on. Um, I don't know. We might have to give her her own eggs to hatch, but Anyway, she, I'm glad we have broody moms. I just don't really love that she wants to hatch quite this early, but she raised several batches of babies last year, and she is a phenomenal mama. And she was hatched here on our place herself. Um, she was only eight months old last spring when she hatched her first batch of babies. Um, anyway, how have the Icelandic chickens worked out over time for us? Really, really well. But there's a whole list of reasons why, and they might all be things that mean they are not the chickens for you. Um, some of the main reasons I picked them as a breed for us to try. If you're new here, welcome. Uh, we live a little over 6,000 feet above sea level in the mountains in Wyoming, so it's cold a lot of the year. We generally have about eight months of winter, freezes through the summer, get temps to the minus 30 degree Fahrenheit range in the winter, etc. So I picked the Icelandic chickens because even though we are considerably colder than Iceland, um, they are fairly cold hardy. They have a reputation for laying well through the through long winters, short daylight hours, um, for being uh, generally good mothers and, and having natural reproduction, uh, for being very good foragers, etc. A little bit of their history, they're also called Viking chickens. They were brought by the Vikings to Iceland about a thousand years ago and they've been fairly isolated there ever since. Uh, when they test their genetics, they're about 78% genetically unique compared to every other um, chicken breed in the world today. So that's pretty cool. And I'm a strong supporter of uh, wanting to maintain heritage breeds, heirloom seeds, the huge variety of um, options that there currently are outside of the main commercial, um, you know, standard white broad-breasted turkeys and Holstein and Angus cows and, um, you know, tomato varieties and Kennebec potatoes, etc. There's this huge variety. So they are one of the extreme varieties that fits very well for our extreme climate. If you live in Florida or Texas, I know there are people going to say, can they handle heat? I've heard they can handle some heat. There are some people who have them in those areas, but there are also a lot of other chicken breeds that handle heat really, really well that don't do well for us. So um, maybe they're not the best one to pick for you. But how have they worked? Now we've had them for almost three years. Is that a choice that I regret or have they worked out well? Um, because I did a lot of research before getting them, but I did a lot of research before getting our blue Swedish ducks too, which if you've been following along here, you probably know we no longer have. They all, I'm gonna do a whole duck update, but they all went to neighboring farms and we have a new flock of khaki Campbells. And I will get into in a duck video about how they're working out. So that was, that was a choice that I thought was a breed that would work well and it didn't for our situation. The Icelandics have been absolutely awesome. Um, I doubt we will ever raise any other breed of chickens. We may sometimes raise a batch of, you know, just meat birds in the summer if we want more meat volume, but Icelandics are absolutely my favorite bird that we have on the place. Um, they have a huge variety of egg colors. Well, not a huge variety. 
um, they have shades of creams and tans and whites and browns. They're not the pink and blue and chocolate eggs, but they have a pretty variety of eggs. They lay a little smaller than a, um, I'd say like a grocery store medium, not quite a grocery store large egg. And some of these are a little extra small right now because we have a bunch of new pullets that were hatched here last summer that are just starting to lay. Um, but it's a very respectable egg for the size of the chicken. An adult Icelandic hen like Foggy, who I had earlier there, is about two pounds, maybe up to two and a half pound bird. They're mostly feathers, of course. And where a lot of bigger uh, egg layer breeds like Rhode Island Reds and such are more like a six pound bird. And they are still laying an egg that's just a little smaller than those bigger breeds and eating proportionally less food, which is a big deal. Um, in our summers here, they free range around our whole three acres. We do have the perimeter fenced. It's only a five foot fence. They could fly over that. Icelandics fly very well. They can easily fly up into trees, 20, 30, 40 feet. Um, but they have, for the most part, chosen to stay in. We did clip one wing on each side. It's kind of like trimming your toenails. You're just cutting the, the tips of the feathers on our very first batch, they kind of learned to stay in and where those parents have raised all of our chicks since, they've basically just taught them the ropes. And every summer it seems like we'll have one or two that hop the fence and then fi can't figure out how to get back over and they pace up and down looking very distraught and clucking at their friends and trying to figure out how to get back in. And I've got to go out around and throw them back over the fence. But they don't do very much of that. And we have never clipped the wings on anybody since. Um, if some chicken here really would rather go be a wild mountain chicken and fly out of here and live on their own, I extend to them the same respect I hope people extend to me and my choices in life. And if they really want to do that, they are welcome to go. It's probably a more dangerous life. I doubt they'll survive. But if they really, really want to leave and aren't happy here, they can do that. Um, none of them have ever wanted to. If you just hop over the fence and you pace up and down wanting to get back in, you clearly don't want to go away. But anyway, they could leave, but they don't. And they all come into their barn here every night. The roosts are up above the camera there. Um, we've had a lot of luck, especially since getting our first adult hens, with getting them to lay in the buckets. These are all eggs. The other white things you see in there right now are golf balls because I was cheap and didn't go buy any nice, pretty fake porcelain eggs or anything. I have originally just put a few in there because I'd read that as an idea for helping young hens get the hint of this would be a good spot to lay eggs. Now I've ended up just leaving them in there. It seems like we always have, because we hatch our own chicks, we always have new generations of hens getting ready to lay and so on. So I just leave them in there basically as decoy eggs and our chickens lay almost all their eggs in here. seems like once or twice a summer, I will find a hidden nest under a board pile or in the grass along the creek or something like that. Um, but it's not very often. Well, right now we got two hens that want to lay in the cat bed on top of the wood pile. Um, pumpkin and freckles are quite convinced that's the only place it's good to lay. But for the most part, we get, even with them free ranging all day, every day, we get our eggs laid in here, which is lovely because we can find them. Um, uh, Icelandics especially can be very good at hiding their eggs all over. So I think having these nest buckets that they really like, and if you want to see more of the details on our barn setup, um, there's a video, maybe I'll try to remember to link to it down below about how we built this barn and how it's laid out. That has worked out very well, but they seem generally happy and content to lay in here, which is a good thing. Though, like most chicken breeds, even when there's identical buckets, and you can see since this film we had added five more on top, so there's ten options that all look the same to me, there are times when they decide that they absolutely must have the one that somebody else is in, and no other will do, which I think is funny. So I'm very happy with their egg laying. Just the other day, I totaled up the what actual production we got over the last year on our hens. Again, in my property journal, where I just write things like the weather and what's blooming or producing or um, things like that for the day for to be able to compare year to year. I wrote down every day how many eggs we got and then divide that by the number of our total adult hens that we had through the year to get an average of 148 eggs per bird. Now that doesn't take into account that right through the um, heaviest laying time of the spring and summer we had quite a few mothers who are broody and because they take three weeks out of laying eggs to sit and hatch their eggs and then usually for most of our birds it seems about five more weeks to raise those babies before they go back to laying, um, there was some significant downtime on production there where had they not been broody, there would have been more eggs. But basically 150 eggs per bird, I'm very, very happy with that. Um, there are breeds that do lay more per year, but those other breeds tend to be bigger, eat more, not really be so incredibly cold hardy and lay well in the winter. Oh, hi. What, what do you want? Buck, buck. Am I in your way? Do you do you want in a nest box? You, you can go around me. 
You can. You, you can. That's Dawn talking to me. Um, they generally don't forage so well. Icelandic chickens have most of their very natural wild chicken instincts. Um, Foggy will let me pick her up. Almost all our hens will let me pick them up where they're broody because they don't want to move off their nest. Otherwise, in general, our chicken flock is not cuddly lap pets. They will come up to me and eat right out of my hand, but they're pretty touchy about being touched, actually. Um, and we don't need to handle them. They do their own things. And I think I'm going to move out of here because she wants in one of these nest buckets, buckets and she really thinks I'm in her way. So we're outside so she can lay in peace. This is Blondie. Like I said, they'll come eat out of my hand, but I should say they're pretty indignant if I touch them. <laughs> she does not think being petted is a thing. Um, this yard is the chicken yard. The reason these boards sit here during the day is because otherwise the ducks go in there and just poop in the chicken water. This is the duck yard. The chickens freely go in there and scratch, um, but this way it keeps the, the chicken water actually clean and free of duck poop. The ducks have their own water tub that they poop in and it gets changed every day or twice a day. Well, you're a hungry lady. Um, but uh, that's why the boards are here if you're wondering. Anyway, so we're very happy with the egg production. As I've mentioned several times, we get a lot of broody mamas. Blondie's never been broody. So far, between our very first eggs that we got from Whippoorwill Farms in Wisconsin, or for our very first chicks, we got day-old chicks, um, and then we have now hatched two generations here on our own place. Blondie is one of our original hens. We have almost all of them. We had one, one die one winter due to some unknown injury. She hurt her leg and couldn't seem to recover. This is Mahogany. She was hatched here this summer, so she's only about seven months old. Um, we've had of every generation of, of chickens so far, we've had about a quarter of them go broody. Um, sometimes a fifth, but usually close to a quarter. You can have some too. I know you're a little more nervous. Blondie's been eating out of my hand for years. Um, that works out well for us because we do let, though I am trying to discourage Foggy a little bit right now because I don't really want chicks when it's still this wintry outside. Um, we want them in general to be able to hatch their own babies and being able to do that naturally is something that was important to me um, from the start. There's Freckles. This is our rooster, Yorg. Or sorry, Leaf. Yorg is in there. We've got Peaches and Arctic Camo kind of have color-ish theme names for all the, the ladies. So are you guys want to eat out of my hand? Yeah, well, Blondie's just going to hog it off. You don't come in here in a hurry. Watch this, though. Oh. I don't know if the camera can catch that. All right, we have really good roosters. He especially will, if there's something yummy, like a bug, he will do his special, hey ladies, here's yummy food call. This is Smokey. Um, and then he will pick the food up and drop it in front of them and make sure all the hens eat before him. Um, York does that a little bit as well, but uh, Leaf is the one that's, that's really good at that. He is also the lead rooster out of the flock. We did start out with two other roosters. Golden Boy was very much like him. He was an excellent lead rooster. He looked out for all the hens. He made sure they ate first. He protected them. And I think one day it cost him his life. No one was watching, um, but this summer he was dead in the yard. All the other birds were fine. It was in the wide open midday. As near as we can tell, he got in a fight with a hawk protecting his hens and um, lost his life doing it, which was too bad. We really, really miss him. Having a good rooster is a wonderful thing. Um, so we kept, uh, both these boys were once that hatched here this, this summer. And so they are our two roosters at the moment. Icelandics in general are known for their roosters being able to mostly get along with other roosters. We've always had at least two adult roosters at a time on the property, and this summer we might go up to three because we have a few more hens. But they have their occasional tiffs, but they pretty well establish a pecking order, and then there's no, like, knockdown, drag out, we're going to kill each other fights. And every summer we've had, uh, you know, 30 to 50 teenage roosters growing up on the place at the same time, and either because 
because of the breed or because they're raised by actual mothers with their, you know, fathers around. It just has not been a problem. I know some breeds, the roosters are extremely aggressive and it's pretty much impossible to keep more than one, uh, you know, free ranging like this together with Icelandics. That is something that has not ever personally been a problem for us and is generally known to not be a problem. So if you want the option of having more than one rooster around, that is a uh, another thing that this breed seems to be a really good fit for. And like I said, a good rooster is something that is extremely valuable. And I know someone's going to ask, do you have to have a rooster to get eggs? No, a hen will lay eggs, whether there's a rooster present or not. They will not be fertilized and will never turn into a chick if there is no rooster, however. And can you eat fertilized eggs? Yes, we do every single day. They also won't turn into a chick if no mother sits on them and keeps them warm for 21 days. So we pick up our eggs every Every day, we never ever end up with like half developed embryos or something, um, unless they're the eggs somebody's actually sitting on that we are planning on them hatching. But all of our eggs are fertilized, but you can certainly eat eggs from, you know, uh, chickens that are, are laying unfertilized eggs, and you can clearly eat fertilized eggs as well. So that's a little bit more about the, the rooster aspect of our flock. <laughs> These guys really like these bugs, especially in the winter when there's less other bugs for them to go for. So having the natural reproduction was important for us. We wanted to be able to replace our flock over time um, because, you know, eventually animals die of old age and injuries and things just like people. And the extra roosters um, we use as part of our meat supply. So the moms hatch whatever babies they want. Statistically over time, that should end up being about half girls and half boys. This winter we were about 60-40 in favor of girls, or this summer, um, but I don't count on that always continuing. So, but they are excellent moms. The broody hens we have had have been spectacular mothers. Not a single one has ever like given up on a nest, walked away, abandoned her chicks. They take great care of them. This is a huge plus for us. If you are in a position where you can't keep a rooster, or don't want to, um, if you don't want any more birds, um, this would be a pain. Some uh, breeds that have been developed for extremely, there's a cat trying to knock over the tripod. If it's shaking, that's what's going on. Um, there are breeds, uh, breeds that have been developed to lay lots and lots of eggs, and they generally have lost their mothering ability because if you were in commercial egg production, like I mentioned, the, um, these are khaki camel ducks that came over because they like bugs too. Uh, you want as many eggs as possible. And like I mentioned, when a hen goes broody, you lose all the eggs she may have laid for, um, the ducks do let me pet them. Well, at least three or four of the ladies do. And then some are a little more spooky. Yeah. Yeah. You're a funny, funny, funny lady. And you like this smell. You are. Um, and, and that's a lot of eggs lost if you have a hen out of production for eight weeks that you're feeding. So in general, with commercial egg breeds, they um, call, which means kill, all the hens that go broody. So after doing that for enough generations, um, having a death penalty for being a, wanting to be a mother, um, there is almost no mothering ability left in the breed. If you can't keep a rooster and you don't want more chicks ever, that may be useful to you. We wanted reproduction, so that made these guys a good fit for us. We wanted this flock to be able to sustain itself over time. Um, we've been able to, to plant several other flocks in the area. Our neighbors have some of our, our birds. My friends in Montana has some of our birds um, and so on. And then the extra roosters, they, uh, they get to hang out here all summer, run around doing totally natural chicken things. I don't have any more. Sorry, I don't. My hand's empty. <laughs> Their duck bills feel very funny. I, I don't have anything yummy for you. I really don't. I know you think there's always treats in my hand, but there's not. Um, and then toward fall, we pick, if we are keeping any new ones, um, the ones that have the best behavior. Best behavior means they are kind and gentle to the ladies and look out for them. They protect the flock. They warn of danger. They make sure the, the hens get to eat. And these two were the most gentlemanly, best behaved boys. They've also been very, very chill around people. I think because they were raised by a natural mother um, running around the property here, they don't seem to see me as another rooster that's competition. They don't seem to see me as a hen that needs breeding. I freely walk in and out around here. We have never had either one of these boys even try to like bluff charge at anybody. Um, 
Golden Boy, our, our lead rooster, before that we lost, he would sometimes bluff charge at me a little bit, but I handled him a lot as a baby because he was from our original batch of um, day-old chicks that did not have a mother to raise them. And I have heard, it seems a little backwards to me, that often hand-raised roosters can be a little more aggressive. He wasn't dangerously aggressive or anything. There's way too many good roosters in the world. If you have an extremely aggressive one, um, they can tear your legs open. They seriously, you know, they have some pretty sharp spurs. These boys are just growing out their spurs because they're not even a whole year old yet. Um, there's too many good roosters. It's not worth keeping one around that is rough. And some, uh, we've had a handful of roosters, particularly one in our very first batch, that was very aggressive toward the other hens, the roosters, the dogs, uh, people, everything. Um, we don't usually name the extra boys, but he got called stew pot number one, and that is where he went. I don't have anything, and you don't want me to touch you, but I know you're lucky. So we like the reproduction, but like I said, if you aren't, aren't doing any of that, this may not be a good fit for you, because like Foggy right now, if a hen decides she is going to hatch babies, she will sit on eggs or golf balls or nothing, sometimes I've heard, until she dies trying to make them hatch. Um, you can break a broody hen of that, often by putting them in something like a wire cage or something where there's no soft bedding for them to snuggle in on the floor, making sure they have nothing to sit on, and after about a week, they will often give up on it. Make sure they have food and water and can see the other birds. Uh -uh. But uh, it's not that much fun to break a broody hen. I would much prefer to just let them hatch their own baby. So if I can't convince her in another day of just lifting her off the nest, tutting her and putting her somewhere else that she's not hatching babies, maybe we'll just give her eggs in her own little maternity crate and let her do so again. She hatched babies below zero last spring. Um, Leaf there, our rooster, is one of those. He was born just a few weeks from now last year. Was below zero his entire time he was being sat upon to hatch. Um, his sisters are in the flock here too. I can't remember now. I'd have to look at my records which ones were in that batch. But, um, so that's a consideration. You can have a very unhappy hen if you can't ever let them raise babies. There's a few other things you could do. You could get some day-old chicks from your local, you know, farm store or something like that. And after they've sat for a few weeks, often if at night when they're kind of comatose, you go in and you slip whatever they think they're sitting on out, like unfertilized eggs, and put some chicks on there, under there. Um, they will often just decide to mother them, and they will be so happy that they hatch their babies. And you can do that, but you would have to have something to do with ongoing chickens if you're going to make a hen happy that way. Um, I have successfully put chicks hatched out of an incubator or mailed to us or ducklings under <laughs> our heads. And they have raised all of those things in addition to the ones they actually hatched. Oh, you found the rest left in my, my bucket, sneaky little thing. Um, they are just excellent mothers. Uh, Ember here is somewhere out of sight right now. Um, hatched a whole batch of Swedish ducklings and was an excellent, excellent mother to them. Um, so that's a big pro for us, maybe a big con for where you are. Uh, they do lay pretty well through the cold and snowy dark winter times. We get very short days here in the middle of winter. We get a lot of snow, uh, we get a lot of cold, and they keep right on laying. We do generally get a, a big slowdown or even complete stoppage right in late fall when the whole flock molts, which is they shed out all their feathers and, uh, and grow a whole new batch of feathers for the next year because over time feathers get worn and broken and stuff. Um, and they, that takes a lot of energy, so they don't generally lay while they're doing that. But the rest of that, we get eggs steadily averaged about every other hen laying about every other day for the rest of the year which works out really well. Feed consumption, again, I mentioned these are small birds. So about two pound hens, the roosters are a little bit bigger. They do not eat a lot of food. Um, you can look back at some of the videos I've done, how we ferment our, our homemade mix of whole grains and seeds. And we have more hens now than we did when I made that video. Um, but we've gone from feeding about four cups of fermented grain, which is all swollen up with water. So it started out as about three cups. That was feeding our flock of 20 birds. Um, all last winter. Now we have almost 30 birds, so I'm going through just a little bit more than that, but still that's a, a small amount. Now they, they do get to supplement other things. We use some freeze-dried bugs, and I need to do a video on where we're getting our own bug production system established just for feeding these guys uh, mealworms. It's a project that is in the well, it's going, but it's it takes some time for them to grow up. Um, 
So they do get some bugs. If we have extra fish heads and guts, you guys have seen us feed them that. I am always growing sprouts on the windowsill for us to eat in the winter, and I often we eat a bunch for a meal, and then I'll take the rest of the jar out here and feed it to the chickens and ducks. I usually grow a mix of alfalfa, clover, and radish, I think, are our favorites. Um, and they do like that in the winter when there's no greens outside. In the summer, they are across this entire property. They turn up all the leaves and stuff under the trees along the creek. They eat bugs from under the trees in the orchard. It is rare for a grasshopper to make it through the open grass area here. I see a lot in like the horse pasture on either side of us, but not many grasshoppers make it through our flock of chickens alive. I'm sure the ducks eat some grasshoppers too. Um, so they do provide a huge amount of their own feed in the summer. Um, if you are going to raise the roosters for meat, Icelandics are not normally considered a good meat breed. They're not a very heavy bird. Um, they don't produce a big fat carcass. They are a very, very good flavored bird, however. Um, extremely rich tasting meat. And the reason this works well for us, if you were going to just buy Iceland chips for I know where I used to make the dice they want to have bugs. I do not feel it. Get disruptions from all the other critters. Um, if you're going to raise a bird for meat, it probably makes no sense to go pay seven to $12 a chick for a day old chick, then raise it for the five to six months it takes them to actually mature as opposed to six to eight weeks for something like a super hybrid um, commercial meat bird like a Cornish cross, and then butcher it and have like a three pound carcass, which is about what we average on our Icelandic roosters. That makes no sense financially if you're going to go buy chicks, feed them for that long, and then butcher them and have that little meat. The reason it works really well for us, we're not buying chicks. We get free spare roosters as a side effect of letting our moms be natural moms and hatching chicks and the fact that we don't eventually want a flock that's all 700 roosters. So the chicks are free. The moms take care of them. They tend to hatch spring-ish. Um, to early summer and they run around this property all summer. I do give them some fermented grain in the summer, but they don't touch it hardly at all because they are so busy eating bugs and everything else they turn up. So they mostly feed themselves. So I'm spending almost nothing on feed. I'm taking almost no care of them because their moms are so good at taking care of them. And so in our situation, that works out really well. We end up with beautiful, nutritious, um, tasty, small meat birds at the end of the fall with basically no cost of money or time into it. So given our setup, that works really well. Like I said, it would make no sense to do if you had to go buy the chicks at an expensive price. Um, Icelandic chicks are not very cheap, um, partially because it's such a, a rare breed, um, and then feed them and then wait that long and so on. But that's why it happens to work really well for us. So that may be another reason it does not work well for you. But they are, I have to say, a very delicious bird. I've heard other people who have grown up in other countries that tend to have better um, food systems in general than the United States uh, say, oh, this, tastes, this tastes like a real chicken I remember instead of what's often found in the, the grocery store here. They do have a higher proportion of dark meat to white meat. Commercial meat birds these days, in this country anyway, are raised to have huge, huge breasts and very little dark meat because a lot of people seem to like that. I'm not sure why. For both Clay and I, we have always preferred the dark meat. So this is great for us. Um, if you uh, have a household that really, really likes eating lots of breasts, that is something to be aware of. If I, if I roast a whole chicken and pull it apart with our birds, I end up with about one third light meat, two thirds dark. That's about the proportions they produce. That's about the proportions normal birds produce um, if they're not uh, excessively hybridized to specifically do something that's the opposite of that. Um, so that's another reason they're a really, really good fit for us. Um, the food efficiency, that is huge. They're producing just slightly smaller than average eggs and smaller than average carcasses, but with so little cost. When I did my video on how we mix our own feed and stuff, I couldn't believe the number of comments I got on, you know, how are you feeding 20 birds with that little container of, of feed? My birds would starve to death. That only feeds three birds at our house, you know, per day, etc. Um, so that's a big thing. Uh, I imagine that a thousand years ago, settlers and whoever all was in Iceland did not have excessive amounts of food to spare through the winter. 
And so a chicken that was able to do really well on what they could find, they're also called heap chickens. They really like compost piles. We have multiple compost piles here. They go through them, they scratch through them, they eat bugs out of them, they eat bits of food out of them. Uh, we do share extra kitchen scraps if we have something like, you know, uh, I don't know, I would say carrot peels, but I never peel my carrots, we eat the peels. Um, <laughs> any little tops and ends of stuff like that, they, they eat that and they like that. Um, they're good at that. So uh, they're not expensive to keep through winters when there is not much forage outside because everything is snow covered. And that's a big deal because snow covered here is eight months of our year. So that's a, a pretty significant <laughs> proportion of the time. They work well running in uh, the breeding method we would use for reproduction would be called mob breeding, I think. Um, so we have two and this summer we might keep more. So we might have a third rooster. We try to pick the best tempered roosters and you know, have ones that obviously seem healthy. Um, I don't know that we've ever had an unhealthy rooster, but healthy and sound and all that. And then the ones that have the best temperaments and then it's up to the hens who they like. And I never have any idea, a particular egg or chick which hatches, which, uh, which daddy it might have. It's always funny to watch their colors as they grow up and try to guess which particular combination of boy and girl might have produced that color of chick. Because that's another thing I really love about them is you probably noticed they are all different colors. Um, Icelandics have a huge variety of comb styles from upright to like floppy to crinkly rose combs to little pea combs. I tend to keep the shorter comb varieties here in our area just because the really big floppy ones can frostbite a little in the winter. The shorter pea and rose combs, I've never had one frostbite. Um, in our uh, barn is uh, thoroughly unheated at all. It is dry, it is draft free, and has lots of deep litter bedding on the floor, but it is not heated. Hi, I hear you meowing at me. Are you wanting to snuggle? Yeah. You can come here and snuggle. Which one are you? Oh, this is Comet. She's got a little white spot on her chest. Yeah. Did you just need some snuggles? Why am I talking to a camera and not you? Oh, I hear you purring. I do. Um, her sister Midnight has no white spot on the chest. That's how I can tell them apart. Um, it is very helpful and there all the birds go are flying because there comes an eagle. Hey Burley! With one eye he sometimes misses some things he would have seen when he had two. The ducks ran and hid and so did all the chickens. They are very, very alert to watching for predators. Other than Golden Boy, who I believe charged a hawk and lost his life trying to protect his hens, we have never lost a um, chicken to any of the aerial predators. And we have hawks, we have a pair of hawks that nest just off our property corner in a neighboring big tree every year. And we have things like bald eagles that fly over. And we have otherwise not lost birds to those. And at night, this door is closed. They do go back inside there every night. Our first flock learned to do that and they've trained their babies since. Um, so they're safe from nighttime predators, but they are out freely all day and they have a lot of natural instinct to be safe with predators. Um, but the different colors, they come in speckles and solids and shaded and all kinds of things. And it's wonderful for me because I can tell them all apart. I know their individual traits. I know foggies are, you know, one of our best mamas. So our Blackie and Ember um, and Rafina. We've had quite a few good mamas. Um, I, I know who's the friendliest. I know who's the most timid. I know who likes to lay her egg on top of the wood pile because I can tell them all apart. That's one thing I don't love about our flock of ducks. They're all brown ducks and I can't, they're beautiful and I like them, but I can't tell them apart. It's really hard to tell who did what. You could leg band everybody and so on, but I'd like that it's easy at a glance. You're not gonna mistake Blondie for Blackie or Blue or Freckles. They, they all look so unique and different. Um, it's kind of like getting to have like 30 different chicken breeds <laughs> when you have 30 birds on your property because everyone looks different. Um, and that is something I really like. That's, that's kind of a little side thing, but I think they're beautiful. I like watching their different colors. It is really convenient to be able to tell who is who and who is doing what. And you know, that way I have notes of which ones, which birds were born which year so I know how old somebody is etc but I can always go back and refer to that I haven't yet started to need to like leg band anybody or anything like that because I can tell them apart just by looking at them so that is really to me so overall Icelandic uh, chickens have been an absolutely perfect fit for our climate our situation we have about three acres here which isn't huge but it's a little bit of space they could certainly free range on less property than that they do not love being cooped up all the time yes there are certainly people who keep them in smaller coops and they do well, but they, they are a breed that really does love 
to forage around and have places to explore. And in the summer, especially, they get up and down here even in the winter, but it's in the summer, especially when there's not big snow banks. I mean, they cover, I don't think any exaggeration is miles during the day. And moms have two or three day old chicks out. They'll have them down by the orchard at the tiny house. Then they'll have them over by the creek. Then they'll, you know, be at the far edge of the pasture and, and back and forth. They really cover ground. So they're a good fit for that. They're a good fit because they are very cold hardy and tough and um, as long as they can stay dry, they have lots of poofy insulation in their feathers, and they raise their own babies. So this all works well for us. If you don't have any space for them to forage, you can't keep a rooster or don't ever want to have babies. Um, if you, if the being broody and not laying eggs for periods is a problem, um, if. <clears throat> The small size, if you're trying to raise them for meat birds, or the lack of gigantic breast meat amounts is a problem. These are all reasons they are probably not a good fit for you. But there are lots and lots of other chicken breeds that probably are. But they are the absolute perfect fit for us. I am so glad we have them. I enjoy watching them every day. And that's our thoughts after almost three years of having Icelandic chickens. Thanks for spending your valuable time with us. I hope you learned something interesting and useful. Or found something beautiful here.